mean, that's a great, it's a great question. And um, I've got some of my um, information uh, from the, uh, the, the National Foundation for the Protection of Social Security and Medicare, as well as the Congressional Budget Office. And the thing to remind yourself of here uh, is this. If we do nothing for the next 20 years, full benefits are there, okay? If we do nothing for the next 20 years, and as Buddy pointed out, after that, 20 years later, if we did nothing, 77? 77%. 77% of the benefits would still be there. Here's the point to remember. All these projections are just that. They're projections. They're based on, quite frankly, very conservative projections of what maybe might is most likely to happen. Um, it could be better. It, it could be worse. It, um, so, you know, depending what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, numbers and models they're using, you will come up with some different conclusions. And, and obviously, Congressional Budget uses one model, AARP apparently using a different model, uh, Buddy's using a, a different model. But the one thing that we all, all the models agree on, uh, financially they're both secure for a long time to come, okay? So uh, from my perspective, I want you to know at least what my view is, okay? And uh, that is, uh, when I ran for Congress here again after being out of politics for 32 years, I promised I wouldn't serve more than 30 years. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> All right. Uh, but as long as I'm in the Congress, I will authorize, vote, and secure, and do whatever it takes to keep Social Security as it is. Raise the cap to a million, uh, whatever it takes. Uh, as as an alternative, turning this thing over to Wall Street, okay? Because that's, that's the business. Um, had, had it had been invested in Wall Street, you know, 10 million people would have lost their benefits here back in 2008. Um, had it been invested in, in the private stock market, people invested in WorldCom and Enron and uh, these other would, would have absolutely nothing. So, in my judgment, there's some scare tactics going on here, okay? Uh, the fact is, there's a $2.8 trillion surplus in Medicare and, and in Social Security today, as we speak, okay? So, um, I tell you, in my sawmill, someone came along and said, take care of this, uh, you know, replace this machine here that's, that's it's only good for another 20 years. But I got another one that's falling apart. I, I'm not. I, I fire the guy. You know, get out of here. You know, if, if we need to make some changes and adjustments, we'll do that, and we'll fix it in time. And if the AARP numbers that you're talking about turn turn out to be the right ones, then we'll we'll make different adjustments than we would if uh, some other calculation uh, to prove that we're in better shape than we thought we were. So you know, that's the point of this. These are all based on conservative estimates on different models, we all know there's a monumental surplus here in Social Security, and it is good to full benefit for at least 20 years, and maybe longer, and it is good for at least 77% of the benefits from, uh, from here on in Fanata. So, but it's a good question. I know people are asking that. <clears throat> Who's right? Who's wrong? I don't know. But I know I will not ever vote or do anything to turn it over to Wall Street. Um, and why, why do they want to do that? You have to ask your question. What's the motivation for that? Greed. Yeah, they want the fees to manage that deal. Make a lot of money. Who wouldn't want a multi-trillion dollar fund to manage and charge fees on that deal? Why we as a country do not negotiate with the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies, what they set as a price, we have to absorb. That's wrong. It's 100% wrong. That is wrong. so wrong. We have to eat up, and that's why they're becoming millionaires and billionaires, and we as middle class is no more. You know, you've raised a good point. 
And we do do that for the Veterans Administration. And for a while there, you didn't. Oh, they I are negotiating I now, but they didn't. <laughs> and other countries around the world do it. That's we pay the high we're prices. The only one that doesn't. We're the, exactly. We're the, the only, only country that, that does not negotiate. Point well taken. And we have votes on that. But and I, 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 for one, have supported um, uh, uh, authorizing you know, Medicare, the authority, to negotiate these prices. That's just good done. business. It's not being done, though. But I tell you, the insurance lobby, uh, the uh, Wall Street lobby, are powerful lobbies. And uh, that's why we have to have these conversations among our friends and our neighbors. We, as small people, will never make it work. It's up to the people that we voted in yeah. to represent us to do their job in bringing the negotiations to the table. Take that back with you. Thank you. Go ahead, this way, gentlemen. Yeah, the surplus is by and for baby boomers like me. Uh, the surplus in Social Security is for the benefits for baby boomers like me. And back in, I think it was in the 1980s, they made projections and adjustments and actually increased the payroll tax a little bit in order to build up the surplus that has been built up, knowing in advance that when folks like me start drawing Social Security, there's, there's so many of us boomers, you need that extra money to, to draw down. And so there are other graphs that show when, at what point, the Social Security surplus will get fully drawn down. Sure, that, that's a good question. It's a good question. <laughs> well, first of all, correct me if I'm wrong, buddy, but the surplus is at by roughly 2.8 trillion today. And I'll walk you through it. Yeah. No, no, the trust fund has a 2.8 yeah. trillion dollar surplus. Yeah, it's the government using now, those funds. Now, let me, and I'll, I'll walk you through that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, but it accumulates. It accumulates. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 now, this is not for the Republican tractors. This is for the citizens. So. <laughs> but I, no, he asked a good question. And let me try to answer it, and then you ask it. Yeah, let me, let, me, let me answer that. I think I understand your question. Yes. <laughs> let, let, let me explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, yes. Yes. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me take you through it, if I could. You've asked the question. Let me try to, let me to you, as repeat I can. the questions. The surplus is created several ways. My mother paid into Social Security. Uh, she was a hotel housekeeper. Uh, she died in 63. Uh, never collected. My brother died in 63. Never collected. My brother-in-law died in 34. He never collected. We all have friends and relatives who paid in and never collected. And that, that helps to account for some of the surplus. The rest of uh, the uh, surplus, or whichever you want to call it, like you said, I, you don't want to get into semantics, uh, over and above what's needed to pay out, is created by interest in the investment of those funds. And the argument has, of course, always been, should, should we leave that money there and not invest it at all? Most people would say no. Should we invest it in private stocks and securities? Many people, like myself, say no uh, because of the dangers inherent in that. So what they have done over the years is they've invested them in government bonds, in government treasury notes, 
which by the way are considered to be the singularly most secure investments anywhere in the world. Uh, that's where uh, the Saudis invest a lot of their money, that's where the Chinese invest a lot of their money, uh, that's where the, uh, the Japanese, people all over the world, because it is the most secure investment. And that's why Social Security has never had a year, never, where they didn't yield a profit. And they have never, ever once missed a payment, because they have never, ever failed to yield a profit. Now, uh, every day, uh, every month, the federal government is paying off those bonds and those notes. And that does, you are right, that does have to come out of U.S. government revenues uh, from wherever they come from. But the fact is, it is a singularly most secure investment anywhere in the world, and that's where Social Security has invested its money. Well, you know, and that's that, that's my concern. be a lockbox on that. that. That money does not go to use to finance the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan or the war in Somalia. Yeah. Oh, no, you are right. You are right. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, that that's a question. This job raises a great point. Can you summarize that? Yeah. Can you summarize that? We couldn't hear a word you said. Whether or not seniors get uh, an increase 
is based on the consumer price index. There's also, uh, it was proposed that they have a chain uh, consumer price index, which is even worse than the consumer price index. Uh, I, among others, stood in front of the White House and met with the president and, and others and, and advocated not to do that. There is also what they call a consumer price index elderly. And that is based on what the elderly spend their money on. And, you know, it's on housing, it's on heating, it's on food. Many of those are which are not included in, in the consumer price index. So it, it ends up that as a result of using a, 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 a formula, back to what we were talking about here earlier, you know, depending on what formula you use, you come up with the different conclusions. Uh, that senior uh, recipients of Social Security haven't been getting uh, an increase. Now, I've sponsored legislation to provide for a 2.9% uh, increase, as well as uh, uh, to, to lift uh, every Social Security recipient at whatever level they are, uh, as a 25% above the poverty level. So there's some unknown person out there telling me what I spent my money on. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with what you spent your money on. So they didn't include yeah, right. that I had to have my registry yeah. care and, and if I had to get a lawnmower. It was basically designed to make sure that you didn't get a price at the cost of living. Yeah, you're not wrong. PERA didn't agree with it or something. No. Thank you. Thank you. Like the state party. Yeah. Yeah. Several. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that. Uh, yeah. I understand there's a lot of resistance in Congress for sport reform, which can greatly reduce medical costs. Why is there so much resistance in Congress for sport reform? Well, um, you're right in that um, uh, the best estimates I've seen, and again, you know, we're back to these estimates that uh, tort reform would. Uh, provide savings somewhere in the one or two percent category. When, when you're talking about um, the kind of money we're talking about, you're talking about real money. And um, a lot of people are playing so, 20 percent. Well, um, you know, I, you know I, I'm sure there's someone who says that. Um, uh, tort reform is all about um, reducing or eliminating uh, someone's right to seek a uh, legal uh, uh, remedy uh, when, when the government has failed. So, um, um, you know, um, he can't figure my mother died in the doctor's office, okay? My mother died in the doctor's office. She was healthy and fit as a fiddle uh, the day that she went in there. And they gave her a shot of something that she was um, allergic to it the week before and she threw up okay so they brought her in a week later and gave her the same shot again and killed her oh, okay. now we didn't sue we, we're not we, we just we don't do that but by people's right to sue um, when you know medical ethics boards and or consumer uh, <clears throat> product manufacturers are putting products out there that hurt people and kill people and there's no remedy or there's no protection uh, from the government or from their own ethics uh, administrators, uh, then they use the right to sue. And um, that's pretty fundamental right that Americans have had for a long, long time. And I would not want to take that away from them. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there aren't some things that we can do in the area of tort reform, and, and I'm open to ideas and suggestions, but not to take away people's right to sue. The idea, I understand, is to reduce the fear of lawsuits by, by frivolous lawsuits. Yeah. You know, by controlling the lawyers who are already rich and crooked. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah. you know, and there's some things we can do along that line. But why, but nobody in Congress wants to do anything. Well, yes, yeah, uh, the uh, uh, new people, and yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> yes, just a follow-up question on one of your things. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we got our social security thing in the mail here 
couple of weeks ago. My wife got hers first. I said, well, how much did you get? Did you open it up? I said, well, I think they said it's 